The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. There you go. Kind of but yeah, it's recording. If, if Y'all decided to switch. For you guys that are in the yeah. webinar, I think there's five or six of you. We're just start cranked it up. We're going to sit here a minute as we normally do. Let people get in from the rain and inside and get keyed in and things like that. Then we'll get going. And we'll apologize for any fidelity issues that we have now. But uh, hope it works all right for you. Hope everybody stay warm and we'll enjoy the heat wave that's coming this week. Okay, we're going to go yesterday. Uh, we're good. Yoda says the sleep is all over the sleep. Yeah. Yeah. See? Yeah. See? You guys all that laughed at me. You guys oh, all that laughed at me. Wait, 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 wait. You and all you Waltonians. <laughs> you know, I wasn't the one. <laughs> I think you remember. We sent the email out, right? I was the guy that said, buy it. I was the first one. That thinks the bomb, isn't it? I was not there, right? The sling pitcher rules. Did you see it, Brad? Did we throw the yellow ones at you and make them do 55 moves? What you we, we had the yellow uh, one moving the other day where it was like right? going like this, dancing like that. Have any experience? Uh, yeah. We had it yesterday. Okay. It was great. Great. What did you think about cage work yesterday? And you could throw the ball anywhere you want. That's, right? It's like, it's like drinking from a fire hose. Right? We're trying to find. We're trying to find. Um, yeah, do you have any questions the from Kate Kirk yesterday? Did we talk about it? Did we cover it? So they stand. Otherwise, they. We're just waiting for a couple minutes until the guys pop up here. And honestly, the first base is We're going to get cranked up here in a few minutes. I thought that boys were coming today. They're not. They are. They're supposed to be. That's what the Eagles said. Chris and. Yeah, they're out the door. They're out the door. Yeah, they're out the door. Okay. Southestrian. That's, that's the best, best job for them anyway. That's Nick working right up against his production possibility frontier.
<laughs> play conference is very important, right? There are some necess there's some necessities that you have to cover. And we're going to have some guys that we uh, are adding to our staff kind of come up here and be plate umpire and base umpire. And then Tony and I are going to be coaches. Okay? You guys have to figure it out. As a, as a reminder, this conference needs to start approximately 10 minutes before game time. So you should be at the plate roughly 10 minutes before game time. So it gives you enough time to go over what you have to go over with the coaches and uh, tender lineups, et cetera, et cetera. So 10 minutes before game time is when this is supposed to take place. Okay. Kevin, you can kind of see the web. You can kind of see the web. Yeah, Kevin. Call us. Call us. How do you call us? Like if, we, like if, we, like if we're in, if we're the dugout, what do you say? Coaches. Okay. They don't know what we're doing standing there. Okay. No problem. Serious home. I traveled today. Oh, I'm not, I guess I'm old. There's a lot of cards. It's only really nice to see you. I see Jerry Barch. Play the CD. The PhD coach? Oh. Straight down. Straight line? Yeah, I do. Jerry, Jerry, Kevin, Dollar, I see. Hey, coach, take a smile. All right. Ballparks enclosed. Play the offenses. That's it? That's it. We're going to close the ballpark. Uh, if there's any questions, we have any calls come out. Okay. Um, <laughs> right now. Any questions, guys? Nope. Let's see, Jerry. Be, be, be nice to me. Oh, yeah. Hey, keep 12 on the bench a little bit. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. So, so does anybody have any comments from out there? Go ahead. Okay. Well, no. Okay. <laughs> So, 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 typical, I would say, youth baseball. Okay, so now we're going to send you guys away. You guys should be our coaches. Over there. Over here. Tony, you Okay. All right. Okay. Okay. Kevin, how do you do that? Good to see you again. Good to see you. Frederick, how's it going? Good to see you guys. Very good. Hey Jerry, can you guys speak up yep. a little bit? Sure. Yep. All right. Want to run the ground rules for us? Yeah. Okay. We'd like to pull, pull right here at the dugouts. Uh, can't elevate on the uh, on the uh, tarp out there on left center or left left side. Uh, there are no holes in the outfield. You get a hole, hole on the side for the dugouts. And that's uh, not Are all your players properly equipped according to VHSL rules? Yes, sir. VHSL has asked us to remind you to stress sportsmanship. If we don't have anything else, good luck to you today. Good to see you. Good to see you. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Jerry. All right. All right. All right. So we see the difference, right? There's, there's two things we have to ask at the play conference, at the VHSL level. You have, to ask, you have to ask if all players are properly and legally equipped, okay? I, I do the same thing Tony does. I ask one question, they have to give two answers. Are all your players proper and legally equipped? Now, I, I did try to trick them, and, and both line of cards actually have two of the same number and nobody caught it. Including me. Including Tony. So. It's very important that line of cards have names. Tony did a good job, right? Going through it and everything. Went down. You just simply missed it, okay? Got to catch it, all right? Um, I would highly, highly, highly <laughs> discourage telling coaches that if you need to argue a call, you can come out and talk to them. That's just what else are they going to do, right? What else are they going to do? Right. They're gonna, so, so let me, and also let me add to, let's suppose I was smart enough to have caught that, and I still don't 
see it. Two number nines. I have two number. Oh, okay. Two number nines. Two. Okay. So I would say now, if I caught this, I go, uh, Kevin. Yes, sir. You got Adam is twelve, and you got Jerry is twelve. I'm One. sorry, that should be Adam twenty-two. <laughs> okay, Adam's twenty-two, and 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 Fred, you have Abel is nine, and and Grant is nine. Are you aware of that? So one of these guys got to be a different number. They know I'll switch him out. Be nineteen. So Grant's nineteen. Right. Okay. So that's the way you would handle it. You don't need to make a big deal of it. Just make sure that they know. Hey, you got two number. Oh, they got two number. Two number nines. Um. Any any questions about that? You said there are two things: so all players properly and legally equipped. So are all players properly? Are all players legal, and are they properly and legally equipped? Right. Tony, Tony and I both do the same thing. We ask one question, you get two answers. Are they proper okay. and legally equipped? Right. Guys, it's that simple. Now you'll get guys who come up and ask you, so hey, this play on you know Thursday. You know, we had this, that, and everything, and blah, 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 yada, yada, yada. Don't, don't feed into that stuff, right? Say, so, you know, uh, I wasn't here, Coach. I, I didn't exactly see what happened. I, I'm not going to be a, I'm not going to be a whole lot of um, Tony, I'm sure you get stuff like that all the time or on occasion. Yeah, but the key is, is that you don't. The less said at the plate meeting, the better. The less said, the better. And you don't want to give them the option to introduce and ask you other questions. You know, they have specific, they have real live legitimate questions you can answer them. Most of them at the high school level are not, which is why you don't want to, you don't want to ask them a lot of questions. You don't want to involve them in a lot of conversation. After a while, you get to know them and that conversation will change a little bit and they'll talk to you a little bit. But by and large, there's not a lot to be said at a plate meeting. Because and now it, it, and and especially in a high school play meeting, they really all you need to know. High school asks that we stress sportsmanship. The high school rule book says that we're supposed to stress it. I'll tell you, I do it probably one out of a hundred times in a play meeting. Okay, um, but but I'm mostly the most important question for you, the most important thing for you to know at a play meeting is that they're legal and properly equipped. Right, that that that's important because they have to be. Because that's kind of like a pseudo warning, which means if a kid comes out here with legal equipment and you penalize him for it, he can't say, well, wait, that's right. No, no, you, you told me your equipment was legal and your players were properly equipped. So now you're out here with illegal equipment and your players are not properly equipped. I have to do something about that, right? And you can learn what the penalties are for that in the, in the rule book. And, and mo most important, you don't, you're trying not to penalize them if you do it. The biggest thing you're going to see is cracked helmets. And if you see a kid come up with a helmet and it's cracking them, just go, look, hey, shooter, go get your new helmet. And they give you grief about it and say, look, I can't help you. The helmet's broken. It's illegal. You can't use it. Please go get a new helmet. The other one is catchers cannot wear two-piece mask and helmet. They have to wear one piece, and it has to say Noxe on the – on the, has to have a Noxe seal on it. And that's all in the rule book. You can see that. So what you're doing is making sure – that it's kind of a beginning where they're agreeing that they're they're properly equipped. So if they come out and they're not, they can't claim they didn't know because you asked them and they said they were. Okay, and it's not trying to play gotcha. It's just trying to set the tone at the beginning that that's what you're supposed to. Do. All right. So something else that 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 everybody else also did correctly was that there's part of a, a pro call for the play conference, right? You kind of call the coaches up. Usually, when you're walking up, they usually know that you're ready for the play conference. So, unless they're, you know, making some last-minute change or something, you're usually coming pretty quickly. Always and forever take the home coach's lineup card first. Looked wow. it over. Why, Jerry? Why? Because Jerry said so. Because Jerry said so. In the rule book. That I did. Yes, it is by rule. By rule, by, you take by, by rule. rule. Okay. See, you know, even you know, you know, that. You know, that. that. Because who is in charge of the field until you get the line of card? Correct. They are. So once you get the whole team line of card, now you are in charge of the game. 
Well, not quite. See, now you got to play rules with me. Not quite. After you've confirmed the line of cards or, and the duplicates are the same, and then you've tendered the line of cards to each coach, then you're in charge of the game. <laughs> the, the other thing, in all seriousness, the other thing is the the – and some of the guys, especially in this area, when you get up on higher level in high school baseball, some of the coaches are old school, like old school grumpy. And old school grumpy, as Kyle said, is you're doing it respect. It's this guy's field. He's the home guy. If you take the visitor's lineup card first, you're disrespecting him because it's his field. Now, is that likely to happen to you? No, it's not. In, all, in my career, I've seen it twice. And when it happens, it's really ugly. It's really ugly because it. this is a guy that – think about the kind of guy that's going to be mad about that. It's not going to be something he's going to pass on, right? I've almost seen a fist fight at the plate over. Like, you know, basically him shouting at that guy for who are you to come to the plate meeting first. They don't even like when they come to the plate meeting first. And two, number two, when you get out to the plate meeting – don't immediately shout into the coaches. They know you're there. Give them 30 seconds or so to recognize you're there. But if they start, like, you're looking around and the coach is wandering over there doing something else, you might go, hey, you know, if you know his name, hey, Dave, we need to get going, please. You know, something like that. So don't immediately go, because you, you create urgency and you add energy where you don't need urgency or energy. Right? You don't need to add energy in a place where there's no energy needed. And that's a really good rule of thumb to follow, especially when you get to um, situations on a baseball field. Okay. So you're going to go over the next one? Right? Or well, I'm not, well, while you're up there. <laughs> so, so Tony, what, what, if, what if the head coach doesn't come to the plate conference and the assistant comes? Then, then what do you do? So what are we going to do when we have a head coach? Anybody know the high school rule when you have the head coach show the assistant coach shows up and the head coach doesn't? What does the high school rule say? Anybody know? These are really silly rules, but they're admitted silly in the sense like what the heck's this got to do with baseball? But it's buried in those administrative rules that become important. And I know what it is on the college level. On the pro level, no big deal. It's a discourtesy. You're likely to get a fist fight between the managers on the pro level, like, why'd you send that dude out? And Unless he already knew that was going to happen. On the college level, I know what the rule is. I, I can tell you what it is. But you guys are all high school guys. You know what it is in high school. Head coach is restricted to the dugout for the remainder of the game, right? If he doesn't show up, and you have to give him a chance to show up. If the other guy shows up, you go, hey, your head guy's supposed to be here. And if the head guy says he's not coming out, then you restrict it. So you're not going to immediately restrict him. If the assistant shows up, you're going to say, hey, you know, if the, if the head guys, you know who he is, is Dave. Go, hey, where's Dave? You know, Dave. You know, Dave. Don't say Dave. You know, Dave's supposed to be here. You, you know that by rule, you can't. Dave has to be here, otherwise, I have to restrict him. So you want to let him know that. But now you, now you've kind of given him the opportunity to rectify it without again adding energy where you don't need that energy, right? You don't need to start the game with a bleep house, right? You don't need that. There should be some exceptions to that. If he's attending to a player who's hurt, is really the only. If he's some kid who got beamed in warm-ups or something, he's attending. He goes, hey, he's over there with number 12 who got hit in the head with a ball. You go, okay, cool. And let the other guy know, hey, he's over there with that guy, and then, and then we move on. Because you better make this guy know because he knows the rule. And if that guy's not here, he's going to want to know why that guy got to come out. Okay, so that's just something simple. There's no penalty for it in, in – um, you, and regular youth baseball, which plays under uh, baseball, official baseball rules. But if you play under federation rules, the guy for you – and for you guys that do aren't in high school, the dude that shows up at the plate meeting, if you have a plate meeting in these youth baseball games, that, that guy is the head coach. He's the manager, and you should address all things through him that you need to address unless somebody tells you otherwise because, hey, I'm – the Skips in the dugout doing something. I'm not. I'm not. I'm the assistant, right? Hey Tony, quick question. Say, for you're on a new site. Say you go. You know, say you can't wait. You know, you're not with your coaching staff. Assistant comes up, and the head coach comes up later. It's like, no, I'm the head coach. And is there yeah, at that point, you can really stop and say, look, I'm sorry, you weren't here. I don't know who you are. I didn't know you were the head coach. 
and right now, and I, this is the way I would handle it. It's not by the book, and I think it, 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 and there are times to be rule book guys, and there's times to not, but I go, look, dude, I'm sorry, but you weren't here. I'm supposed to restrict you to the dugout. But, but you know what? Given that I didn't do it right then, and given that you're not the head coach, you're going to do we're going to play with this guy as the head coach, and you're going to have to you're going to have to be act as an assistant coach, which means I'll have to work through the guy that came to the play meeting. And if he has a beef with you, go look. I really don't want to restrict you. Remember, I can restrict you by rule. And if he keeps doing it, go look. Please, do we really want to push this? And if he does it again, go okay. I'm sorry. Now you're restricted. And then you have to make a mark in your lineup card with the guys that are restricted. If you treat them with some respect and remind them, hey, I, I don't want to do this for you, it's not going to get there, right? It's not going to get there. And that's going to happen to you everywhere. And I'm sure it's happened. It has. And the other thing, too, is as long as you know, you're realistic with the coach and the coach isn't a tight bomb, it's me for sure. The, you know, the other thing about that, Kevin, is – the, the likelihood of you going somewhere that somebody hasn't been there with you, yeah, it, it's, it's slim and none, right? The, the, the odds of two new people going to a site are slim and none. Somebody's been there. Somebody probably knows the coach, right? So the reason I'm really bringing it up because some coaches have retired this year. And sure. Are coming on right. But, but, but generally speaking, right, you go there, hey, that guy ain't the head coach. You might want to ask where Jay's at. Okay. Yeah, something like that. Um, the, the other thing I was, the other point I was going to make is like, you know, the, the, the team captain doesn't come to the plate conference. You know, the, the, the third assistant doesn't come to the plate conference with the head coach. It's the head coach, the umpires, that's it. <clears throat> right? That's it. Um, and, and if they do show up and they stand behind the coach and don't say, and they're respectful, don't make a scene about it. Let them hang out there. As long as it's not causing a problem. Again, don't add energy where energy is not needed. Right? Just keep that in mind when you're doing baseball. Don't add energy where energy is not needed. Because the only kind of energy you can add is tension. And tension is bad. Right? Tension is bad. Okay. So so you had the play conference. Both head coaches go around. As, I don't know if you guys can see on the web, webinar or not, but – your base guy stands on the other side of the plate from you, okay? So the, the plate umpires at the point of the plate, literally I, I stand almost on the point of the plate. The base guy is on the other side, okay? Once they break and go away, sometimes we'll stand across, across from each other, across the plate, and sometimes we'll come over and stand side by side, right? My, my preference is to continue to stand like this because it's a lot easier to have a conversation than it is to look like the last supper. And stand over here going into it. Until once the player, once the catcher comes out, once the catcher comes out, I'll come around and stand next to him because now we're getting ready for the national anthem. But until that point, and it doesn't matter what you do, my preference is to stay out in front because I think it just looks it looks kind of weird to me for two guys to be standing next to each other like this and continuing the conversation while they're over there talking to the players. It just I, and I don't see Da Vinci anywhere with a paintbrush, so I'm going to stay away from there. So, so once the catcher comes out, or both teams come to the line, right, for the anthem, right, at that point, the base umpire would come over and stand here, right? It's plate umpire, base umpire. There's more than three guys, more than three umpires. Then oh, the we're going, we're going, we're going. Yeah, we're that's, base, that's right. Base, so it's base, base umpire's on the first right base side, plate umpire, <laughs> right, this yeah. side. Okay, and we, we're going to stand here. When the announcer starts with, and where you're going to stand is your toes are on the back edge of the batter's box line. Toes on the back edge of the batter's box line. Okay. Okay. Look, this, this all sounds sounds kind of trivial trivial to everybody, but at at Cage Road yesterday we talked a little bit about presence, right? What what does this show, right? This shows that we're taking every aspect of the game seriously, right? That this is very important to us, right? And it is. Okay. So we told the line. He's in, he's on the back edge of his batter's box, on the back edge of my batter's box. About the time the announcer says, ladies and gentlemen, please rise and move your hats for the presentation of the national anthem, right? And and don't remove your hat until the anthem is there. 
Don't stand around with your hat on waiting for a whole bunch of steps, right? Don't just leave your hat on until he says, ladies and gentlemen, and at that point you can get it down in your and you're gonna in your right hand and hold it down by your side. Put your heels together. So heels together, feet at about a 45 degree angle, right? This is called roughly the position of attention, right? At, that, at this point, you're gonna stand here, hat in your right hand, left hand, even if you have your mask, this thumb along trouser seats, okay? You're standing at this at position of attention until the first note. You hear the first note, this takes a little coordination. There's you, usually the plate guy is for all intents and purposes the crew chief, so movement is on him. So out of the corner of your eye, you see him, and when he begins to move to bring his hat up, you bring your hat up. And you put your hand over your heart, not your hat, not down here, your hand over your heart. So it means your hat may stick up over your shoulder. Your hat, like that. okay? And you stand here at the position of attention for the duration of the end. You don't chew your gum, you don't sway back and forth, you don't sing along. You stand here until the last note. At the conclusion of the last note, you take your hat, return to what we call order arms. From there, you then put your hat back on your head. And if the flag is not in center field, say the flag is a place where it's over there, turn your body to the flag so your belly button is pointed at the flag. So if you're standing on the toes on the line and the flag's over there, turn to the flag like that. When you both stand still on the line, facing that direction. Now at this point, right, he can't see me, so now he'll cue that. So when he goes to bring up, I'll bring up. Right? Look, th this sounds kind of, I don't want to say ticky-tack, but, but to a lot of us, this is a really big deal. Okay? To, to anybody who this matters to, it matters. Frederick? So when he's off center, you're not, you're actually behind him. Correct. So you're staggered. Correct. Yeah, you would, I would never come over here and stand next to Tony in some weird configuration. I'm still going to toe the line on my line. We're just going to turn it face. And that doesn't happen in most places. Most places, you're most places the out of the center. center. So you just, you just turn to it. And, and if you do it right, it looks good, and you're going to get compliments from people that it's important <coughs> to. People that it's not important to aren't going to notice what you do one way or another. They're not going to care. But people that it's important to are going to notice. And then they're going to notice, and they're going to remember, and they're going to remember you in a positive way. And that's, and that's, what we, that's part of the being what this is. You don't have to like standing for the national plan. You don't have to like any of it. But if you're going to umpire for us, that's what we do because that's the way umpires do things. Okay, if you want to do something else, do it away from when you're umpire. And I, I don't have a problem with it, and I would support whatever it is that you want to do away from when you're wearing an umpire uniform. When you're wearing an umpire uniform, you lose the ability to, to do whatever it is that you thought you wanted to do during the national anthem. Okay? If you want to Colin Kaepernick it, do it on your own time. I will support you. I will. I'll be the first guy to defend you, and I'll fight with Jerry about it. And Jerry knows that, right? But I no, I'll fight with you. But this is not the time. Okay, this is not the time. The other thing, by the way, and this doesn't happen very much in high school baseball, and there's not really yet. Maybe they explicitly put in a rule before. But when the anthem ends and those kids stay on the line, shoo them off the line. Go, go. And if they don't go, say, don't make me eject you. Do not allow student athletes to stand on the line after the anthem is over. Do not allow it. I don't care at any level. If they want to stand there, tell them go. If they don't go, you can eject them. Say, it. don't make me eject you, because I will. Because, by the way, we don't even need a national anthem respect for that. It's in the rule book. The rule book says there can only be nine defensive players on the team. It says the offensive team is allowed two base coaches, a batter, an on-deck hitter, and batter runners. Those dudes aren't batter runners. They're not on-deck hitters, and they're not hitters, and they're not coaches. So they are on the field illegally. 
if they're not one of the nine players in the field and they're on defense and they're standing on the line, they're on the field illegally. Tell them to go in the dugout, okay? Tell them to go in the dugout or you will eject them. Now, I've only seen it happen one time in a high school game. One time. I don't have a problem with it because we deal with it in college more often than we should. And I've, I've had my arm twitching and had a coach save a player from getting run. I told them, I'm not too sure. Does that mean know what he's talking about? Yes. Standoff. Yeah. National Stand anthem standoff. Stand Don't let them do it. It's, a couple of colleges made it real popular on, on YouTube a couple of years ago, having the standoff. They're both towing the line. Kids are out there warming up, everything. Umpires did nothing about it. The game almost starts. No, they let them start. I know the guys that were the umpiring, game, they let them start. The game starts to be set kids on the line. Look. The, and the reason that me and Tony are up here, right, last note, down, head on, at that point, bodies should be moving away, right? I mean, that's last note, one, two, three, four, five. That's five seconds. That's five seconds to move your body off the line and get back to the dugout. <laughs> I almost, I almost ran a coach one time because he wanted to bark at me because I barked at his kids to get off the line. I was like, well, I'll, I'll eject you too if that's what you want. Disrespect in America. Get off my line. Get off my, get get off my, my lawn. Lawn. <laughs> And remember, too, and remember, again, you don't need to yell at him because you're, if you're the first base umpire, where are you running? You're running up the first baseline. Where are they standing? First baseline. So you just let them go, come on, fellas, get in the dugout. And if they just... I've asked you to get in the dugout, right? I've asked you. you they keep doing it. Said, look, this is the third time I'm asking you. If they don't move then, go, okay, now I'm going to start running you. I'll start with you, and I'll work my way down. So do you guys want to go, or do you not want to go? And if they don't go, okay, you, done. Guess what's going to happen to the other guys? Is it going to get there? No, because you gave them four chances to get off the line, right? Don't Again, don't add energy where you don't need to add. That energy. Work with that. Okay. The passion finishes last note, put your hat back on, based on her best base of fire with the turn of the dog out the Generally speaking, yes. But most of us we break when fielders take the field. Right. Okay. Right. So so they, they run out of the field, they turn out to go. And most times in high school, the players are on the field to do the national anthem. So you're going to run, you're going to disappear when the anthem's over because the player's already there. If you have two teams that line up on the line and there's no fielders on the field, generally we won't break until the fielders come out on the field. Most high school teams, the players are on the field when they do the line, when they do the anthem, okay? I don't know if I missed it when I was still out front. Um, Tony, you said sunglasses. During the oh, late we, 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 we did we didn't address that, but that's a good point, Mike. So, so at the plate conference, if you chew a pack of gum during the baseball game, or you chew on sunflower seeds, or you wear sunglasses, right? None of that during the plate conference. Don't chew gum when you're talking to coaches. Don't be spitting sunflower seeds during the plate conference. Do not wear your sun, sunglasses at the plate conference, right? Like Tony said, with the whole taking the home coaches thing, not only is it in a rule book, it's a sign of respect, right? I don't care if they're wearing sunglasses or not. You take yours off, put yours in your pocket. Right? Stand there and be respectful. Kevin? Prescription. Well, right, but I mean, we're talking about oh, no, we're talking about sunglasses. I'm just trying to get why you need to wear prescription tape off. Well, I mean, if they're, if they're progressive, right, they're only going to be so dark. You know, you're know, you not going to wear any of these. You know, if you got your old police and you're on the plate, the plate meeting, take the daggum things off. You have a pocket in your shirt. Put them in the pocket of your shirt. Do not wear them on your hat. Do not put them Guy Fieri style on the back of your head. Do not hook them on the back of your belt. Put them in the pocket <laughs> of your shirt. You have a pocket. You don't like that pocket because they stick up a little bit? Put them in your pants pocket. You have pockets. Okay? Again, it makes you look more professional. Right? Hat up, glasses on the hat make you look like you're going to the beach. Right? We're not going to the beach. So all it is is about looking professional, right? And I know for some, some of you are thinking, oh, this is ridiculously petty. I promise you it's not. And there's an old saying in umpiring, 
if you look the part when you show up and you act the part when you show up, and Nick will tell you this, it works for sure, you'll get through three or four innings before they figure out you can't work. Okay? There, there's, there's a story of a signer when to go watch a guy possibly giving him an opportunity to work some Division one baseball. He left at the plate conference, the signer did. He's like, I saw all I need to see. I don't, I don't, I don't want to see anymore. If that's how that guy acts at the plate conference, he's not working. I don't know how true it is, but it's true. I, I, I wear a hood, and I like you put in your umpire pants that the, the, the inside of the pants can actually scratch it like this. I take a coat of cloth, put it in, and I put it in. You work a game where it's like starts daylight, and it's on the main face that you're in at nighttime. The same thing, and put it in your pocket. Don't put on your hat, nothing. Spring a little, little be work. Bring a little. Envelope and a little bag it comes in and use that to put it in and put it in your pocket. Any questions about any of that stuff? Then we break from mechanics a little bit, talk about some of some that stuff from it. Any questions about any of that stuff? Line of cards, what to do with them, what to write on them. So so do you remember when you look at the line of cards and Jerry caught me because I didn't I, I really was kind of just showing you the motions. I really wasn't paying attention to be honest with you. And I read the names. I knew they were Abel Winkle Charles, but I didn't look at the numbers. What you're looking for in a lineup card, and Jerry kind of messed it up to begin with, and I didn't. I thought he just messed it up because he messed it up. And I really, but on a lineup card, what you're looking for is nine or ten different names. Okay, the names all have to be different. If they're not different, make sure that the names that are the same have initials. If you have two names and they have two initials. Right, so now, it's, so let's say you have nine names or ten names, they're all different. Make sure you have ten different numbers. Okay, that all the numbers are different. Then make sure that you have nine positions and or a DH. So make sure you have nine or ten positions. And we'll teach you about the pitcher DH rule in high school, about who can DH and where they can DH and all that kind of stuff. But make sure that there's one name, one name, one position, one number. If you have two names and they both have different initials, it's a good idea and it makes you look like a million bucks if you go, hey, you got Jones B and Jones A, Jones B is 22 and Jones A is 23, is that right? And he goes, oh, no, I got, or, yeah, 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 those are the right numbers. Okay, and then, and that makes him think for a minute, oh, and then, then you look like you're paying attention from the beginning. So don't just take the lineup cards and count. Read the names. That's how I knew they were Abel Baker Jones, but I didn't see positions, so I didn't think he wanted me to go there, but fool me, right? Because I was going to say, Jerry, you don't have any positions here. Which guy is which, right? Because each guy has to have a position listed, right? Because in high school, it's really important because pitchers and catchers are treated differently on offense than anybody else because pitchers and catchers can have people run for them. Okay, pitchers and catchers can have courtesy runners, so that, that's why you need to have nine players, nine positions, or, or ten positions, or ten players, ten, nine, or ten different numbers on each lineup card. Technically, the lineup card should be signed. Technically, they usually aren't, but technically they should be signed. But and and make sure that if you look at a lineup card and the date isn't today's date, like some of them dated, just go, hey, you know, this is the different date. And you could catch a problem right there. He might have carried up the wrong lineup card. I, and I've seen I've seen that happen once. Where I go, I, today's not the twelfth. Today's the today's the sixteenth. Oh crap! I grabbed the wrong, wrong lineup card. And then he brings it up, and it's a different lineup card, right? So that's fixable, and it doesn't matter what happened, who got it, if the book that doesn't make any difference. The lineup card you have in your hand is the only lineup card that matters. Lineup card you have in your hand is the only lineup card that matters. No other lineup card matters. Doesn't matter what he has. Doesn't matter what he has. Doesn't matter what the nice school lady that keeps the book has. Okay, don't make any difference. It's not like basketball, right? The one that matters in basketball is the lady sitting there with a book in front of her, right? That's the one that matters. Okay, in baseball, the one that matters is the play guy. Okay, that's the only one that matters. All right, so. So that, that's all high school stuff. <clears throat> now we're going to touch base real briefly on youth ball or travel ball stuff. Okay? Um, when we have that kind of play conference, I'm still going to ask, 
Are players properly legally equipped? Why? Because that takes the onus off of you and puts it on them, right? It makes you not liable for whatever happens to those young kids, okay? Almost every youth ball game you're going to work is going to have some form of a time limit, right? I highly suggest, we're going to put it at, that your base guy invest whatever $6 it is, buy themselves a little stopwatch, okay? Hour and 45 minutes, whatever it is, starts at the completion of the plate conference. You don't carry your cell phone on the field, use the time. You don't go by the home coaches, stopwatch, cell phone, whatever. The base guy keeps the time, generally a stopwatch. Okay? Click it, put it in your pocket, forget it. Don't take it out. Take it out, it's like the fourth inning. See what, see how much time you have left. Don't look it at after every batter, every inning, okay? I think that's the, the, the one caveat to all that stuff, okay? Six bucks, put in your car, put in your umpire bag, anything, the base guy holds that, okay? The umpire has, has enough worry about it. Do a little work out there. Frederick? You're gonna get some pushback from other people besides Oh, we still got a minute left. Wait, uh, my watch. Time starts right now. And, and, and tell them, don't keep it a secret. All right, gentlemen. Six innings, hour 45, correct? Billy Knowledge, that's correct. Okay. I'll start the clock. Please just play conference. Any questions? Well, can we just round up the six o'clock? Nope. <laughs> nope. Okay. The reason for that is okay, if you play five extra minutes, and little Johnny gets hurt, and they're only supposed to play an hour and 45 minutes, who's liable? Who let them keep playing? Who's in charge of the field? <coughs> you. you are, right? Tony, and, 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 yeah, and I can tell you, I, I don't work a lot of youth ball, but I did work some with Jerry this year, Jerry and my son, and it was really weird to watch both of them and it's like, and then it dawned on me why they're doing it. They, the plate meeting went in, and they both look at the guy and go, time starts now. Like, and, and it was explicit, like, in there, time starts now. And they both nod and went off. I was like, what's going on? And then I realized, oh, okay, we're playing under a time limit, right? So seriously, there, nobody's going to notice or think about just go, time starts now, boom. And if you have a stopwatch, you're more credible because we're not, not pretending that we're not, did we start at this time or that time? Anybody buy a stopwatch at Walmart for 10 bucks. A lot of uh, almost every youth baseball game you work is going to be time limit. Yeah, and and the reason oh, it's either going to be time limit or runs are city. Well, see, you're talking about playing a 16 inning 12 year old game in a local house league. We don't do a lot of house league stuff. Most of the stuff that we do house league stuff, but most of the stuff we're doing is five games in a day on a field or eight games in a day on a field and. And you can't get five minutes behind because if the first game's five minutes behind, the last game is an hour behind. And that's why, and that's why that is. And and the other really cool thing too, you will see, and I and I saw experiences in the little bit that I worked with my son and Jerry this summer, is those dudes are ready to go before time. So if they're ready to go before time and you're ready to go before time, just get out there and get going. Just the sooner you can start. The, the sooner you can finish from their perspective. If they're ready, don't force them. If it's a 10 o'clock start, don't force them to start at 9.55. But if they're ready to go at 9.55 or 9.45 and you're ready, start. Because if something stupid happens, you put your ne next game, because you're likely to be working a minimum of two games. I know a lot of you, Fred will tell you he'll work like 35 a day if they let him. But Fred will work four games right in a row, and if you get that first game behind 10 minutes because they're not ready to start, then it snowballs. And, it, and if you start that first game early, the rest of the games have plenty of time for them to get on the field, get ready, and get going, and you'll keep your whole day on top. Okay? And then it's weird. And usually that's usually on fields where it's back to back to back to back. If you go – I don't imagine like over at – you guys at work, say, over at Tuckahoe or the Little League – do they still do the time limit? 
That's good money. That's good money, boys. Go ahead, Curtis. Another thing you can do is if you finish a game, most of the time, if not all the time, the other teams that are going to be playing behind it are going to be there. So if you get done, go over and find a cut. The cut. You know, we finished early. How much you Generally, they're going to want to get their pitchers ready. Once that's done, they're ready to go. And so you can agree and be cordial about it. Take 10 minutes. And you share with both sides. You go up, you have a drink, you come back down, and you drop it off. Right? Okay. So you don't start a new it depends on the rules. It depends on the rules. Sometimes it's no new innings. Sometimes it's drop dead. You know, whatever the rules are, these guys who have been around a lot, they they know it inside and out. Greg, did you have a question? Yeah. Depends on you. Depends on the rule set. There are some drop deads and there are some no new innings after. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, and we know most of the stuff that you'll do the. Rules will, when you're assigned to a tournament or whatever it is, it'll go, remember, this tournament is under these auspices. You can find their rules in this section of the arbiter. And then they'll, and you'll see their timing rules in that section. If you don't know when you get there, there's an admin. you can find an admin. And generally speaking, both coaches will know anyway. And, and, and the few times I've been around, and because when we run clinics, we run clinics a lot on these type tournaments and the coaches know exactly when the time's limited up and you ne almost never have, they just go, man, it's, it's last inning. Let's, you know, let's move it along. I, 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 I've only seen that like one time or two times. It doesn't happen very often because they know and they're, and usually they're playing for big organizations and they're, and they're part of that big organization and they know, and they're not going to make us think about it. So don't worry too much about it. Yeah, but you'll know that too. So. Any questions? No? All right. Uh, we're going to take a five minute break. And then, oh, that's fine. Then we'll get into R1. Mark, can you pause the presentation? Mark? No. Minutes, We're going to pause, fellas, out there in La La Land, and we'll down, start again in a second. Down the hallway to the right, right from across the corner, is, uh, uh, has uh, water fountains, uh, big machines. Yeah. I And I thought it was just a mock line yeah. part. And so I was being smart. That's why I read the numbers, names, because that's what I do all the time. Right. I always read all the names. I always look at all yeah. the numbers. And I was like, oh, you just hand it to numbers. I, 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 didn't, I didn't think about that. But the if you would put positions in, you'd have I probably would have caught the numbers yeah. because I would have paid attention. Yeah. Yeah. What's the difference between stop and pause? I don't think there is a difference, so we'll crank it up again. So the All right, we're back. Anybody have any questions about anything we did in the first part? Any questions at all? Because I'd rather ask your questions and not answer them and have you run away and go, I don't know what the heck they were talking about. Even if you, you know, just some clarification or anything. Anybody have any questions? Nothing. Everybody's good. I mean, it's straightforward stuff. It's not like there's nothing. It's not like you can do A or B. It's do these things and and do those and be aware of those things. So, um, 
what we're going to do today is last time, remember we talked about mechanics, we covered nobody on base, right? We covered nobody on base and we went through our responsibilities. Today what we're going to do is we're going to cover R1 only. Okay, R1 only. If we get a little more time, maybe we'll go to R1 and or maybe we'll go to R2. Okay, but R1, R1 and R1 only and R3 only are similar. Uh, R1, I'm sorry, R1 and R3 are similar. Um, maybe we'll talk about those. We'll see what happens. But for right now, R1 only. Remember, all of our mechanics are set up and everything we do is in order of priority, right? And our order of priorities are ball strike, ball strike fair foul, fair foul catch, no catch, safe out, safe out obstruction interference, touch, touch, retouch, right? And then we can work down the list, okay? But those are the big, those are the six things that you're going to see over and over and over again, right? So ball strike, fair foul. So that means all our positioning, remember our positioning, the rule of our positioning is how close can I get to a play? Only so close as I can get to my next responsibility, right? So our, my next responsibility, the play guy is always going to stand down in here, right? Because he's responsible for ball strike, okay? He's first responsible. Although the base guy, when he was on the baseline, because his next play was going to be at first base, and if it wasn't, he would have plenty of time to get to second base, we put him over on the foul line to help with ball strike, right? In particular, check swings, okay? Because we thought he'd have a better look at that over there. Well, also, you won. Plate umpire is going to be back here. Why ball strike, right? U1 can also still help out with ball strike. That is check swings. It's a little bit harder, but he can still do it. Don't be afraid to do it from the position I'm going to show you. Just do it. If you see, if you think a guy swung at a pitch, if you add judge that a player attempted to hit the pitch with the bat, call the dog on thing strike if they check. All right? They check, check. Okay, and we'll talk about those rules a little bit later. Now the problem is, is my first play as a base umpire. I put a runner on first only might be at second base. So I can't start over where I was at first base, right? Because it's going to be really hard for me to be at second base before the runner gets to second base and beat him. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put you ahead of the runner, which is another <coughs> rule that we talked about last time, right? You want to be ahead of your last runner. You want to be in front of the last runner you're responsible for, okay? So when we have R1, so we're going to have a runner – over here out of frame, okay, because I, kind of, I tried to kind of blow this up bigger than I could do it so we could see what we're talking about. So what I'm going to do is with runner on first only, I'm going to put the base umpire in a position that generally is referred to as B position, right? The position we had the other day was called A position, right? B position is a position that is going to be we're going to draw tangent lines from the plate through the edge of the mound all the way out toward the outfield, right? So you imagine a rope on the ground with stuck in the back of the plate, pull the rope tight through the edge of the mound. Anybody know how wide the mound is, by the way? Anybody that's not first or second year guy know how wide, the, how big the mound is on 90 foot diamond? Who's not? Who's not, not a second year guy who hasn't been through this before? Anybody know? Anybody new? Five feet, so you think the mound is only that big around? That doesn't make sense, does it? That's okay. No, there's nothing wrong with that, right? It's probably bigger. It's probably bigger than five. Okay, so ten would be maybe as round as this table. It's probably bigger than ten. Anybody? No, it's not fifteen. We're getting closer. No, it's eighteen. Eighteen. Generally speaking, the mound is eighteen feet, right? 18 feet in diameter, right? Okay, 18 feet in di diameter. Okay, 18 feet in diameter is generally what it is, okay? okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to draw a line from the plate all the way out through the edge tangent of the circle. The reason I tell you 18 is if the mound, you kind of can't make it out because you're on a dirt infield. Thankfully, you don't work a lot on dirt infields, right? Only in Chesterfield, only in the Chesterfield high schools that – don't sit and don't have lights, right? But whatever it is, you're working on a 
dirt infill is a little bit rougher, okay? But we're gonna draw a line from the edge through here, okay? And we want the, the first base umpire to have that line go through the middle of him. Okay, so we're gonna be straddling that line, okay? How far, now the question is, is where along this line are you gonna be? Well, you certainly don't want him in front of the mound, right? So we can throw that out, okay? So <clears throat> if you think about what his possible responsibilities are, because he's got, if you think about it, if I put him in here somewhere, his first responsibility is always is ball strike, right? And where I put him here for ball strikes is probably not going to make a big difference, right? Where I set him up along here. Is he going to have any fair foul responsibility from here? So now all the fair foul is going to go to the plate guy, right? So now we're going to give all the fair foul to the plate guy. So when this guy's in here, what's the first play he might have? Be careful before you think about it. Be careful before you say it. What's the first play he might have? Balk is possible, but again, that probably won't matter much where we put him, right? So balk could happen, right? Okay. We we're not, we can have check swing, but we already said that's probably not going to happen. So after that, what's the first play he might have? Could be a pickoff, right? Could have have a pickoff. So that means I got to have him in a position where he can see a pickoff, right? Where he can see a pickoff. So if you think about a pickoff, what's happening, I'm going to draw kind of a base over here. The, first, the runner is going to be diving back toward the base like that, right? And the first baseman is going to be standing in front of the base here, and he's going to try to tag him, right? Okay, so he's going to try to tag him. So he's going to be standing here and try to tag him. So now, if we think about what we said, angle over distance, right? Angle comes first. We probably want to be in a position that gives us what? The best angle. The problem is, is if we did the best angle, like right down through here, that's going to put us over here somewhere in front of the mound. That's not going to work either, is it? So we're going to, what we want to do is get in here where we're going to have the best possible angle we can get. So what we're going to do is we're going to try to be halfway between, and you can use either mark. It doesn't matter. Different people talk about it differently. It, it should amount to the same thing. You can be halfway between the, the, the mound and the cutout. Anybody know how far the cutout is from the base? It's supposed to be by rule, but there is no by rule, but by suggestion in the rule book. These are all really cool things to know, and the reason they're really cool things to know is because a lot of what we do on the field is determined by closeness and position, and I'll say, I want you to be this far from a play or that far from a play. So if I tell you I want you to be – a certain distance from a play and that play happens at second base and you know the cutout is a certain distance, guess what you can do? You can judge your distance based on the cutout. So, Mr. Nickel, how far is the cutout usually from the base to second base? How many? Five. Try it again. How many? Three. Try again. How many? One. No. 13 feet. What? 13 feet. Look at the rule book. 13 feet is the suggested distance. Man, man like that. <laughs> suggest they ain't five feet. I guarantee on to you. Look it up. Thirteen feet. Okay. So you want to be about. So that means that's about thirteen feet. This is about again about five feet. So halfway between, or you can go halfway between the rubber and the base. They're both going to amount to about the same thing, right? You're not going to get. You're going to get a half a step difference, maybe a step difference either way. So you measure your distance as halfway between the rubber and the base, okay, halfway between the rubber and the base, so whatever that distance is, and that's where we want this guy. Okay, straddle in the line, and we want him facing square to the plate. Go ahead. You feel, I think that gets closer. I'd have to look at the Little League rule book, but I think those get closer to about 8 to 10 feet. I'd have to look on Little League. Specifically, on Little League, but I don't know for sure. Yeah, so, uh, you still probably want to be in the same place, and because you're going to have, well, in little in youth field, what you're going to do, let me check that. If you ever work on a 60 foot diamond, what you do is mirror this, but go outside second base. So you would keep running along this line and go outside second base. 
okay? And the general rule, by the way, we won't talk about 60-foot diamonds, but the general rule in a 60-foot diamond, most of the things we do will be the same. Most of the coverages will be the same. But the general rule in a, in a diamond like this, if the ball is out of the diamond, you're in. If the ball is in the diamond, you're out. Okay? So if the ball is inside the bases, you're outside of the bases. If the ball is outside of the bases, you're inside the bases. That's kind of the simplest way to keep it. And then you want to be sort of off the left shoulder of the, the right shoulder of the second baseman, right? Is it the right shoulder? Left shoulder? Right shoulder, the, the inside shoulder toward the base, to, okay, of the of the top. Okay, so we, we, we won't do too many 60-foot diamond, 60-foot mechanics because I'll screw them up. But um, no, that's kind of the basics, okay? All right. All right. So now I want you about there facing the plate in a hands-on knee set. Okay, to start hands-on knee set. Hands-on knee set means shoulders. Right. You want your feet closer together than you think because you're not coaching third base and going to just stand there. You actually have to move. So you want your feet close enough together to be in an athletic position. You want your hands on knees, you want to be in an athletic position, which means shoulders, feet, shoulder width are slightly wider apart. Your hands on your uh, above your knees and your arms kind of straight like this. Hands on knees set so your look set when the guy's set because you want to be set when all that mess happens. Okay? That's the position we want you in. Okay? You don't want to be really wide like this because if you're wide like that and you got to move, you have to go, you have to get up, bring your feet together, and then move. If you just start here, narrower, in an athletic position, all you got to do is stand up. As you stand up, you can move. It's one less movement you have to make. I'll gain you a half a step to everything you need or a step to everything you need to do. Okay? So be in an athletic position. It would be the same thing you would do at first base. We talked about at first base will allow you to be in more of a, say, a runner start if you want, something staggered. But still, we want to be athletic. Okay? And athletic is not really wide. Right, athletic is a little more narrow. Okay, good with that. Okay. By the way, there's another position over here that's mirror of that. It's called C position. And when we're not in A or B, we're in C. Okay, and we'll talk about when we're in those positions in a in a little bit. Okay, or I could just tell you right now. Basically, you're in A with a runner on first and first and third. Any other runner combination, you're in B. I'm sorry. You're in B, runner on first and first and third. Sorry about that, Jeff. Jeff, you got that? Apologize. Runner on first and first and third, you're in A. All the other are B and B, 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 B. First, first, and third, all others C. And don't reinvent the wheel and tell me you want to be in, in B when you're supposed to be in C and C when you're supposed to be in B. This is pretty cut and dry. Runner on first, first and third, you're here. All the other runner combinations, you're over here. Okay? Again, why? Because I want you as close as I can to your first play without moving you so far away from your next play, you can't get to it. Okay? So what's your first play likely to be from there? Pick off, right? Pick off. Okay? Pick off. Frederick. Athletic position is important. That is true. It's a lot harder to get out of the way when your feet are this far apart and they smoke a ball at your noggin than if your feet are together. Halfway between the rubber and the base is easiest, right? Because that way, even if you're on a field where you can't see the edge of the mound, you're going to be okay. Okay. Halfway between the rubber and the base. So I've got a comment about B also. You always want to keep aware of your surroundings at those balls and all <coughs> Don't look down at the feet. Don't look behind you. Keep your eye on the ball. At least be aware of where it is. A guy can throw a big ball at any time. Keep your eyes everlasting on the ball, right? Everlasting on the ball. Always know the status of the ball. That's a great point. Always know the status of the ball. If somebody asks you where the ball is and you don't know, that's bad living. That's why we want to keep our belt buckle pointed at the ball at all times. Okay? We want to keep our belt buckle, our nose, and our chin pointed at the baseball at all times. Okay? And don't forget, you can draw some of yourself on the back picks, too. So if you catch a third down first, you want to be relaxed with that. All right, we're good? 
So uh, again, think about our starting position is the function of what's our next play. And then I can only be there because in a pickoff, boy, wouldn't I like to be right here? I would really like to be right there. If I had an extra umpire, guess where I am? Right there. But I don't have that umpire. So my next best is here. Why? Because I can't be so close to this play, I can't get to my next play. So what is one of my next possible plays when I'm there? So let's go through our responsibilities again. Fair foul, not me, right? Fair foul, not me. Okay. Ball strike, possibly. Right? Ball strike, possibly. Okay. And and there is no definition of check swing in any rule book, <laughs> except maybe the college rule book. You just have to decide, do you think that guy made an attempt to swing at the pitch? If you do, it's a strike. If you don't, it's not. Okay? So you have to be prepared secondary help on that all the time. Okay? Good? Pretty good. All right. Our next responsibility after ball strike is fair foul and then catch no catch, right? So now we have to ask, what are our catch no catch responsibilities when we have a runner on first base? Okay, we have a runner on first base. And we have a plate umpire here and a base umpire here. Okay, that's what we're going to ask. So let me blow up the field a little bit. See if I can make the field a little bit bigger and get that idea. Foul lines, foul line. We'll just make the diamond right there. We have F7, F8, F9. So I'll start with outfield fly ball catch, right? So my U1 is somewhere in the middle here in that place I told you. I'm not going to try to be too fancy here. I'm going to play on fires here, okay? Fly ball to the outfield. Fly ball to the outfield. When the ball goes to the outfield, U1 is responsible for all catch, no catch. Okay? Unless... Unless the plate umpire takes responsibility away from him. Okay? Unless the plate umpire takes responsibility away from him. So now our question would be, when would the plate umpire take responsibility away from U1? Right? Now think about why U1, think about our laws of umpiring. The reason U1 is responsible is he has proximity, right? He has proximity. He's closer, more believable, okay? So when do you think, or let's think about when would we rather have the plate umpire be responsible for the catch-no-catch no catch than the base umpire? Well, one obvious would be, since the base umpire can't have fair foul responsibility, if I have this guy running over here and I could have a possible fair foul call, I can't have one guy looking at the catch and another guy being responsible for fair foul, right? That's not going to be credible to anybody. And over here, same thing. So if the, either of the corner outfielders is moving toward the line in such a way that you think the catch-no catch as the plate umpire is going to also include a fair foul decision, then you as the plate umpire should probably say something like, Silvestri, I will take responsibility for the fly ball catch, no catch on this play. Okay. Jerry? Jerry's been with me. I will do exactly that. I'll go, Barshi, tell you what, I'm going to take responsibility for this catch, no catch right now, and you don't have to worry about it. <laughs> no, -uh, I promise you. In all seriousness, in all seriousness, if you're going to take responsibility for a catch, no catch, remember when the ball, and we'll talk about this a little bit more, the mechanics of it, what's the base guy looking at? What should the base guy be looking at? The ball, right? Where's the ball? In the outfield, where's his plate umpire? Behind him. Can he see his plate umpire? So if the plate umpire is going to do something, he better do what? He better tell the base umpire, yo, shooter, I know you can't see me, but I got you, right? 
all honestly, here's what the red, the preferred communication would, would be. The ball's going to be over here, right? If the ball's going to be over here, I would yell, Kyle, I got the ball, right? And then Kyle knows, and we'll talk about, there's a couple things that Kyle knows from that. But right now he knows that all he has to now worry about is the runners. When I say that, that doesn't mean you should take your eyes off the ball. Because if I... I've said I'm going to take responsibility for it. Another way to do that, another word we use to describe that is we think the ball is trouble. Okay, we think the ball is trouble. So if something is trouble, don't you reckon we ought to have two people look at it? Okay, so you still want to look at the ball. You should still try to see and help with the catch, no catch. Okay. Yes. Guys, what Tony's talking about in trouble is important, but even if you're the plate guy and your base guy has a can of corn to the outfield, watch the catch. There's two umpires. There should be two sets of eyes on every fly ball catch to the outfield. Why? Because it's our first responsibility on a batted ball. Your first responsibility is catch, no catch. I don't care which guy is primary for it, the other guy's secondary. And catch, no catch precedes all other nonsense. For, forever and ever. If you're the plate guy and you don't have anywhere else to go, nothing else to do, ball hit uh, you know, 400 feet out there, stand there and, and, and watch it a little bit. You know, lean, take – Hey, come, you know, maybe you can't run real far. You have players coming. Look at it. Have an opinion. If something weird happens, you need to have an opinion. What were you doing? I was learning the touch of first base. How far down? I can't tell you the number of times it happens in a year. So, sorry. It's a good point. It's a good point. Okay, everybody good with that? So here's another way, another reason. So we have we have fair foul decision. Another reason might be. The, the left fielder is heading back or the right fielder is heading back toward the corner toward the fence and the ball might or might not get out of the yard. I like to say it threatens the fence, right? Guess who should be responsible for that? Plate umpire, so he should say something, right? If the right fielder or left fielder are going to make a catch where they're going to be running those directions are going to be catching the ball below their chin, then this plate umpire should probably take responsibility for it. Okay, then this plate umpire should take responsibility for it. All right, makes sense? Okay, so if he's drifting over to the line like this, and the ball is going to be nowhere near fair foul, right, and nowhere near a stressful catch, just let the base umpire have it. Why? Because he's credible. He's more credible than you are because he's closer. Make sure that you have to have either a fair foul, you believe you're going to render a fair foul decision, or you believe this guy's going to make a stressful catch moving in this direction. Okay? Good. Or the same thing over here. Okay? If this guy, so now let's think about other stressful catches. If this guy's making a stressful catch in this direction, who do you think has responsibility for it? Base guy. If he's making a stressful move straight in, he's going to come in and straight in and scoop the ball up, who do you think has responsibility for it? Base guy, right? And if you, by the way, if you're a base umpire and you see one of these guys coming straight in under a stressful situation, should you just stand there and watch the ball so that's your what? What should you do? And what else should you do, Kyle? <laughs> I love when you catch Kyle sleeping. Love Kyle to death. Kyle's batting a thousand tonight. Yeah. <laughs> Don't just get to the dirt line. What's our first rule? These guys should know. What's your first rule? Proper position is defined by angle and distance. So what's the first thing you want to do? Get an angle. What's the angle you're trying to see? If the guy's going to make a catch like this, you want to try to look through it this way, right? 
So you need to build an angle when you go to the grass dirt line, right? Because you can't cross the line. So you need to build an angle when you go to the grass dirt line. By the way, I did forget one piece of communication. If the plate umpire is going out this way, it really doesn't make any difference because the base umpire is smart enough to know which guy's going to catch the ball. Communicate something. Technically, the language that way is, Kyle, I have the line, right? And this is, Kyle, I have the ball. Now, why anybody would stress all that, I, I, I know why, and I'll explain to you why later. But if Kyle hears me yell, he knows that I have the line here, and he knows that I have the ball here. Because otherwise, why would I be yelling if the right fielder's chasing the ball? Okay? Which is why you don't yell, Kyle, that's yours. Because if I yell, Kyle, that's yours, and he doesn't hear the that's yours part, guess what he's done? He's given up responsibility for the ball, and while the ball's in the air, he's moving around, keeping his eye on the ball, but less intent than I am, still looking at it, moving toward where his next play might be. Do Communication is really simple in baseball and when you umpire. It's important, but it's simple. When the ball goes in the air to the outfield, who's responsible for the catch? No catch. Base guy. If nobody says a word in that entire process, who has the catch? No catch. Base guy. If somebody says something, who has the catch? No catch. Play guy, right? Because otherwise, why would he be saying anything? So if you say something like, Frederick, that's yours. If I hear my name, and this happened to me in, in a – in a place that it shouldn't have happened to me from an umpire that shouldn't happen. I heard the umpire yell and I turned around and I go, what, why is he taking responsibility for this? And when I turned and looked as like, I was confused. Like my brain just went, and I was like, Oh crap. I better watch the ball. And I look and he's not doing anything. I go, well, why did you talk to me? Well, I just wanted you to know you had it. <laughs> I, I know my mechanics, big guy. I know what I'm supposed to do. Don't tell me because you confuse me. I didn't think of that. Yeah, I know. That's why we're talking about it right now. Okay? Communicate when you have to. Hey, everybody good with that? Hey, so, Tony. Can, yes. Tony, you're the late guy and the base guy, right? Balls are right over my head. Hey, Tony, that's mine. No, no, no. I'll take it. Don't, I don't ever want to see you do this, too. And, and you guys won't because you haven't been around. But if you've ever seen an umpire go like this in the middle of the field, yell at it. Take responsibility for the ball. Go, no, that's mine. Because he doesn't get to tell you who has catch, no catch responsibility. You do. It belongs to him until something happens. Do not turn around and do this. Yes, I'm well aware that it's yours. We had a pregame, and we read the manual, and it belongs to you. Thanks for telling me. Okay? Just do your, do your, take your responsibilities. Okay? Okay, cool. Infield. Infield's a little tougher because most of that's going to be line drive. Look, pop up in the infield, guess who that belongs to? Base guy, right? Unless you have infielders moving toward the line and they're going to catch the ball on the line and it's going to be a fair foul decision, in which case the plate umpire should probably tell you what? I got the ball, right? Communicate in some way. Hey, I'll take that, Okay. If there's line drives and the field corner infielders are diving to the line, that's got to belong to the play guy because he has fair foul and catch, no catch, okay? Other than that, the base guy covers everything. The books probably read the book. There's probably slight variations. I think the best thing to do is let's be honest. This dude's in the middle of the field. These guys are all in the middle of the field. If the catch, no catch is in the middle of the field, who is the most credible? Base guy. So guess who should probably take the catch, no catch? Base guy. Okay. Some, I can't remember what R says, but even this play where these guys are going straight in, the base guy's right there. He can look sideways and, and see the catch, no catch with the guy skipping. Okay. In any event, if you ever have a line drive on an infield where you don't know, you both should look at each other before anybody does anything. And if you're the plate guy, because you can't see the base, you can see the base guy, he can't see you. Don't do anything until you're sure he does. Okay? Don't do anything until you're sure he doesn't. Okay? Okay? Easy enough? That's catch, no catch. It's relatively simple. Okay? That's catch, no catch. Yeah. <laughs> Typically, that's going to belong to the play guy, but that's going to be really tough. 
because it's going to be smoked and the play guy's just going to be done tracking the ball and it's going to look, it's going to be tough for the base guy because he's looking through bleep holes and elbows, right? So you're going to have to do the best you can, make eye contact and see what happens, okay? That's what you're going to have to do technically is the play guy. <laughs> technically, and by the way, pop-ups to the catcher are all going to be the play guy. That doesn't mean the base guy can't help and look, right? That doesn't mean the base guy can't look. <clears throat> Guys, this is another case where, like, keep gathering all the information is really important, right? Those smoke shoestring line drives, right? If, if you're quick on the trigger, right, to call him, you know, that's a catch or, or, or no catch, right? You, you, don't, you don't have all the information, right? What is it before you call it? Nothing, right? So, so we, we've all had those, right? Smoke bag, bam, holy cow that what's going on i'm gonna look he picks up shows it to you oh well he thinks he caught it well you know what everybody else thinks he caught it he caught it right right he picks it up takes a couple shovel steps loads the third first yep hey that's no catch right get gather the other information right if if the ball players think they you that, that they caught the ball and they want to show you they're going to show you Hey, I, I got it. Hey, I got it. Okay. You know, make the call. If my partner has a different opinion and the coach comes out and wants to talk, get clear. Uh, maybe this, we can or can't fix it. Maybe we can or can't fix it. Maybe he has opinion. Maybe he was looking to touch of first base. All right, real quick. You're the play guy, and Kyle asked me to remind you of this because we were talking about real quick. If you're the play guy and you have pop-ups to the catcher, the best thing for you to do just take your mask off and stand still and look at the catcher. Look at the catcher. Don't try to find the baseball. Look at the catcher because that dude wants to catch the ball, right? He wants to catch the ball. So you need at this point to be a matador with your mask off, right? And because if he wings his mask, you got to be able to go, was it Cuzzy this year or Angel that caught one or knocked one down? Angel knocked one down. like Bang, knocked one down. I think he caught one too, right? But you need to be like a matador looking at the catcher because if he throws his helmet, then most of the guys are wearing the helmet, so they just drop it and just go behind them, right? But look at the catcher. Unless he's going to go over to the backstop, kind of stay at the point of the plate, and then make an adjustment after he comes settles in under the ball. Because what do most pop-ups to the catchers are going to receive do? They go back towards the infield, and if that ball drops near the foul line, who has fair foul responsibility? Play guy, and what's more important, fair foul or catch, no catch? Fair foul. Okay, fair foul. So we want to stay on the line until we're sure it's not. If you think, if you both believe, the catcher believes is going to be at the fence and he runs to the fence, right, by all means, run to the fence. Unless you have a runner on third base. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> by the way, if you're the base guy and this is going on, don't just stand there watching. If the ball is really foul, really, really foul or coming back, you can drift over toward the foul line and help because if the ball is foul and ends up foul, where's the runner go? No place, right? So be helpful. Get into a position where you can see, especially if the ball is definitely going to be foul. If it's if you're not sure, you got to be careful, right? Because how far can you go to help? Only so far as your next play will allow and what's your next play likely to be if that ball lands fair, play at second base, right? If it lands fair, play at second base, right? So only so far as he allows, okay? So we'll do that. So now let's talk about what comes after catch, no catch. Stay foul, right? So remember, we were usually going to go through our series as fly ball, ground ball, base hit, other, right? So we did fly balls, ground balls. We got a ground ball. Okay. If we have a ground ball, a ground ball hit on the infield. By the way, let me let me back up for a second. This is something you should learn to do and do all every time a ball is hit. You'll hear me say this, and if you read your manual, you'll see this phrase: step up, turn, and face the ball. Step up, turn, and face the ball. When the ball is hit and it goes by you, this is really easy. Really easy. Even I get it done most of the time, right? 
If the ball goes by me on my right, the ball goes by me on my right, the ball's behind me. I would like to look at the ball, but I would also like to remain athletic when I do it. I never want the ball to be behind me, and I never want to turn my back on the ball for the things that we said earlier, right? So the easiest way to prevent me from turning my back on the ball and not seeing is it, here goes the ball by me. If I take a step with my right foot when the ball's on my right, watch what's going to happen. I step with my right foot. I step up, turn. What's happening? I'm, my chest is staying on the ball, and I face the ball. If the ball goes by me on my left, and I step with my left foot, to be able to face the ball, i got to bring my right foot around. I turn, and I face the ball. Step up, turn, face the ball. So if the ball goes by you on your right, step with your right foot. If the ball goes by you on your left, step with your left foot. Jeff, if it goes right over your head, pick a foot. I don't care. Okay. Goes over your head, just step, turn, face the ball. Generally, though, it will put you in an athletic position all the time, and you will never turn your back to the ball. Because if your back's turned to the ball, bad living. Right, Kyle? You ain't never been hit with a ball in the infield. Have you thrown a ball? You have, haven't you? Whoa, a boy. Okay. Bercy, you ever been hit with a thrown ball? Really close. Because really? all of a sudden you'll be like the ball come winging by your ear. I've been lucky. I've never been hit either. But step up, turn, face the ball. That's something we're going to say a lot, okay? So now we have a ground ball in the infield. What do you think is going to happen? And we won't worry too much. Just give you responsibilities. We'll worry about the mechanics of it later. What do you think is going to happen? Ground ball in the infield. What's the first play likely to be? Second base, right? So who's responsible for that? Play to umpire, right? Now they're going to get the guy out at second. What are they going to – Likely to be the next play. Play at first base. Who's responsible for that? Base umpire, right? So the base umpire is responsible for two things. So a little bit later, we'll have to show you some footwork that you can do to get both of those things because you're responsible for both of those things. Okay, what's the plate umpire responsible for on this ground ball? What's he responsible for? He certainly isn't responsible for out safe on either play, right? Not responsible for out safe on either play. So go down your list. The ball is batted, so fair foul is done. Strike, strike, ball strike is done. Fair foul is done. Catch, no catch is done. Out safe is done. Whoa, see how easy this is, right? All of those things are done. What comes next? Obstruction interference. Is there anything we might have to worry about? on a ground ball that's going to turn into a potential double play. Yeah. We could have interference at second base, right? Remember, for all the rule codes you will work in, interference is a safety rule. Got interference is a safety rule. Okay? It's a safety rule. You don't get the pass on it. So you, we will talk to you about interference until you're blue in the face at some point. But right now, you have interference. So the play guy is responsible for interference. But let me back up for a second. The base guy is also responsible for interference because if he has safe out, his next responsibility is interference obstruction. If the base guy sees interference at second base, guess who's responsible for it? Base umpire. If the base umpire sees interference, call the interference. Even if he turns his head. Go yes, ahead. even right. The base umpire is responsible for interference. Umpire in order. Safe out, obstruction interference. Then your next play. Because if you have obstruction interference at second base, there is no next play. Right? If you have interference at second base, there is second base, there is no next play. Why? Because the ball is dead immediately, and both runners are out. Any other runners go back, but we don't have them right now. They're both out, okay? So the base umpire, he's responsible for his first responsibility, since he doesn't have any of the other things we've worked all the way down the list, is number five, obstruction interference, right? So he needs to do what? Be in a Proper position to rule on the play. That's like rule number four or something. Law number four, right? Proper position. Proper position. Still in distance. 
So now we have to think about the plate umpire. What's his responsibility? Interference at second base. Interference at second base has to do with the runner sliding outside of a direct line between the bases. For the most part, we'll worry about the subtleties of the rest of the subtleties later, okay? But for the most part, if that dude slides straight up the baseline, he's okay. Okay, he's okay. For the most part, there's some things he can do that doesn't make him okay. In high school, he can't pop up, he can't kick him, he can't grab. But you can see kicking and grabbing and popping up from almost anywhere on the field. The straight in, ideally, where would you like to be to see the straight in? Ideally, what would your be your ideal position to see it? Straight in. It, wouldn't it be standing in the first baseline, looking right down the first baseline? Any of you going to get there? No. Okay. So what I want you to do is remember that line I drew out that told you where B position is? I want you to run along that line toward the mound. When that play happens, I want you to be toward the mound there. And I want you to watch that play come in, keep watching until all the players have stopped moving. When all of the players have stopped moving, we can't have interference anymore. Okay, because that that can that interference can happen after the ball gets thrown away. Remember, it's a safety rule. It's a safety rule. So you come up along the line, come up along the line, and you watch. If you don't have any interference, okay, what's your next play do you think is the play guy? Somebody's got to have a dead ball overthrow, right? Remember we said all the other things? So here's one of the other things that comes down the list after touch. Next one down the list is dead ball overthrow. Who's going to be responsible for the dead ball overthrow? Play guy. So what the play guy is going to do is run up the line. When he's satisfied that that is not an interference, he's going to make a right turn collide. And he'll run toward the foul line. The short. Shortest distance possible toward the foul line. And he's going to watch the ball and rule on any overthrow whether the ball is alive or dead. That's his next responsibility. Now, when all that's all done, we go back to work in different positions, okay? Everybody good with that? Those are our responsibilities on a ground ball. Okay? How about a base hit? How about a base hit? Okay? In a base hit, you commute umpire pre-pitch and post-pitch while the ball's in play. Pre-pitch, 